Voice actors maintain a continuous presence in our lives, providing the words for announcements, commercials, and characters in nearly every form of media. While they don't have the luxury of sharing their appearance, expression, or body language, they have freedom from being typecast and are not constrained by age, race, gender, or even species. They may work in solitude or with an ensemble, using their natural voice or character voices. Above all, these are actors, some classically trained, others self-trained. Most of these actors have worked for years paying their dues before they became voice acting specialists. They have been compared to studio musicians, skilled, technical professionals who get the job done efficiently and no perfect. Who are these men and women whose voices we hear and whose faces are unfamiliar to us? We could walk past these people on the street and never know they're on a hit television show, movie, or our favorite video game. Let's explore the world of voice acting and some of its unseen yet shining stars. From an early age, I always did voices, and um, so when I moved to Los Angeles, I originally came out here sort of looking to get into sort of sketch comedy and writing, and um, what happened was, a few years after I had been living out here, I got a very interesting call from my writing agent saying, hey, do you want to do a voice for f this family guy? And I was like... What is Family Guy? I, I first got into acting to be an actor, and I didn't know exactly what that was going to be. Um, my, my, my gateway was, you know, stage stuff, doing plays, and then I started making movies with my friends, and then, you know, started auditioning for, for TV and film stuff, and then got into voice acting after that. I went to school at the University of Michigan, and I was, um, I got a degree in musical theater and psychology, really two very useful degrees um, and I was in a dance class it was the end of the class and voices I just I did them all the time they would just come out I knew that narration fascinated me cartoon voices fascinated me uh, you know whenever I saw a good acting then I enjoyed it and then I got an opportunity to audition for Juilliard which I did I got in and I went there for four years so altogether I trained in class for about 10 years. When I was a kid, uh, I, I did this movie called Kindergarten Cop, and I made the horrible mistake of telling kids on the playground, oh hey, I'm in this movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I got bullied for it, I had people pretending to be my friends, finding out I was not a movie star with tons of money, and then hating me, so it was awful. Um, but I did this show called Problem Child, the animated series based on the, uh, I think they were in the 90s, uh, the Problem Child movie series, and nobody knew it was me. And I could tell only my friends and swear them to secrecy. Nobody would ever find out. And I was like, wow, this is great. I get to be an actor and uh, I get the privacy. I get, I get to have my own life. My favorite aspect of voice acting is that you can completely play against type. When I was doing on camera acting, um, even though I look pretty Caucasian and I am American, I would audition for these parts that would be looking for like the all American dude. And I would always get asked, so what, what's your ethnic background? And it would be like, well, American. I mean, my mom's Hispanic, but you know, I'm whatever. And that would always hamper me. Like, I, I wouldn't get considered for certain parts because, you know, I didn't look American enough. Or if I was auditioning for a Hispanic part, because I speak Spanish as well, uh, I didn't look Hispanic enough. So I would always kind of be on that line where I didn't look enough like this guy to get this part and not enough like this guy to get this part. But it doesn't matter at all if you're doing voiceover at all. I can play a big uh, thundering lug whose voice is way down here. Or I can play a little tiny person whose voice is way up here and it's not like a little girl. And it's fine. I can do either one of those things and anything in between. So I don't have to worry about like, uh, you look kind of like a nerd, so you can play the nerd. Uh, which is, that was my on-camera experience is, you know, I'm like soap opera nerd. That's basically what I look like. It's like not good looking enough to be lead, not really freaky enough to look to be like sitcom nerd, but voice acting? Do anything you want. Be a monster, be a demon, be a fairy, whatever. You can do anything you want, and that's what's awesome about it. One of the fun things about animation is people can't see you. And I get very self-conscious. If you can see me, I don't want to look foolish, you know? How am I sitting? How am I crossing my legs? How does my collar look? There's, a, there's a, an appearance anxiety that doesn't exist if you're doing voiceover. And it reminded me of telling kids, my kids when they were little, I'd tell them bedtime stories. We'd turn out the lights and they'd really use their imaginations. You could tell them all these fantastic stories because, you know, they, they think of it, it's theater of the mind. People, people often think that uh, 
you know, to get into voice acting, they'll need to do all these crazy voices. Like, you know, people come up to me all the time and they say, I do all these crazy voices and all these impersonations and, um, you know, I should totally be a voice actor. And I'm like, okay, great, that's, you know, that stuff is good to have, you know, in your, in your back pocket. And some people are, uh, some actors I know are really, really good at that. Um, but the simple fact of the matter is 90% of the time I get hired to do this voice that I'm doing right now. Um, maybe make it a little younger, maybe make it a little older. It's hero time! In order to be believable in different mediums, you need to emphasize different things. For instance, when you're acting on film, um, and certainly when, when I'm here talking to you and I, I'm on camera, I want to make sure that I don't move too much. Because if I move around too much, I start to become sort of squirrely, and it becomes hard to listen to me. It literally becomes hard to hear the words that I'm saying if I move while I'm talking on camera. So you'll notice that film actors, they may do a lot of business, and then they stop and they talk to you. And when they talk to you, they don't move. Now, it's exactly the opposite if you watch an animated character. For an animated character to look believable, and any Disney animator will show you this, they must move while they are talking. While they are talking, they must move. And if they stop moving, the character falls dead. They literally fall dead. That's why in video games you'll see characters that have that sort of constant motion, because the video game animators don't want the character to fall dead. So what's believable? Well, I think the main difference between voice work and on-camera work would be that you have to portray all of your emotion through your voice in cartoons and voice acting. I mean, if I was doing on-camera acting, I could use my facial expressions and body language to portray that, but in voice acting, um, I can also, you know, you can see the cartoon so they can draw and animate body language, but uh, making all the emotions come through in your voice is the most important part. You know, in on-camera acting, you can convey a feeling with an arch of an eyebrow or a you know, lip curl or something with your mouth or doing something with your face that you don't have the ability to do in voice acting. You have to make that uh, intent heard through the words you use and the way you use your voice and certain hesitations in your voice and certain tonalities in your voice and pitches that on-camera people just don't really think about. I've seen video of myself while voice acting, while trying to produce different vocal characters. I look insane. I would never act that way if I were on camera. And actually it was quite shocking to see it, because, you know, I have seen myself on camera. And I certainly also know what it means to act on stage, and how, how you need to comport yourself differently in order for people at a distance to believe you're acting. Original animation, uh, it used to be, and to some extent still is, an ensemble affair where you have about six actors in a room all with their own mics and, and music stands where they have their scripts. It just depends on everyone's scheduling and if they can get people together and obviously if like I have a lot of lines with them because then it is cool to do it together because you can get back and forth and feed off of each other and feed off of each other's energy. If I'm doing it by myself, sometimes they have, um, if someone else has recorded before me for the same project, then sometimes they can play it back in my headphones and I can hear the other people's lines and they'll play it in for me before my line. So I'll get the same effect of being able to respond back like it was an actual conversation. There are a lot of differences between anime, American animation, and video games. Obviously the first thing in anime is that the animation already exists and the voice actors are dubbing. They're recording to animation that already exists and trying to match the lip flap of the characters. Now that's true for the Japanese as well as for the Americans. That's just how the Japanese like to do their animation. They like to do the animation first. When we do anime here in the US, um, they find that it's more cost effective for studio time to record all the actors individually. So we're going in one at a time into the studio to record our parts, but we're still having to match the lip flap on the screen. It's just we don't necessarily have anyone else to play off of. Video games are non-linear. They can have a lot of different outcomes. So you have to be there um, for, I mean, you have to be giving 120% for all of your deaths. Every possible outcome for this character. You have to die on fire, you have to die a gunshot, you have to have your head cut off. Most of the time I don't have a script ahead of time, um, although well, it depends. Sometimes if I'm, um, if it's a show, they will send me that script. I'll go into my booth and I'll, you know, I'll look at my auditions that I have and um, I'll take a moment to, you know, read through it a couple of times, familiarize myself with the text, 
and then I'll hit record and I will record several takes and then I will stop and I will go and edit those together and sort of listen, figure out if I like what I've done. If I don't, then I'll maybe do another one. Uh, and by the way, then I will send the, that audition via MP3 uh, email uh, to my agency. What changed is we just came in and saved Wakanda from an alien invasion. You're welcome, by the way. Usually I prefer to stand because I feel like you just have more energy standing. I mean, sitting can be kind of passive and you can just get sort of comfortable and kind of lazy. So if I'm standing, I can also do like gestures in the booth. Like if I'm saying, pixie dust away, I'll usually be swaying my arms or chanting. So I do try to do a lot of body language because I feel like people can tell through your voice. If you're up in front of a mic, it doesn't matter that you're not in the actual physical place. You still need to physicalize, you still need to do all of that, because that, that movement, all of that comes across in your voice. And you have to warm up your voice, otherwise you'll lose it. Um, it must look weird, you know, if I'm driving the studio, because I'm laughing. <laughs> On the way to the studio, of course in Los Angeles, you know, people probably don't look twice at it. Look at that guy over there laughing maniacally in his car, just another, another kook on the freeway. <laughs> I played George Bush uh, for the movie Recount, um, which was a, you know, kind of a serious movie. Uh, so they, it was kind of a parody, but they also needed a decent George Bush voice because they shot the actors who looked like him, but they didn't... Um, they couldn't impersonate him, so they sort of shot him from behind, had me come in afterwards, and I would, uh, I would give life to his, to his, uh, to his uh, visual performance. I enjoyed that. I also do Bill Clinton, obviously. I'm never going um, to live down certain things that happened during my term. That's true. But I'm very proud of my wife, Hillary. I'm extremely proud of her. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, if I'm going to be doing presidents, uh, you know, I'm going to do Barack. Uh, who I've done for, you know, American Dad, and, and some other programs, uh, which, uh, you know, I can't share with you because it's uh, confidential, uh, top-secret information. The whole storyline behind Gargoyles was not being, you know, it was very, it was very um, Martin Luther King in a way, you know, was being judged by the content of your character. We can't hide from the world. We must live in it. We must search for allies, kindred spirits, and sometimes we must take chances like we did tonight. To do otherwise is to remain forever alone. So what I like to have is an age range, um, a, a picture is great, um, or a brief description of the character, um, whether they're, you know, maybe they're ditzy, maybe they're shy, maybe they're, you know, anything that characteristics that are going to affect the way that you sound. Um, like, say you're, um, maybe if you're shy, maybe you don't talk very loud and you're just a little bit introverted and, and shy and scared. And, or maybe if you're, like, like, if you're a tomboy, maybe you talk really fast and you're tough and you're, you're gruff. And, or, you know, maybe if you're really smart, maybe you talk fast, but maybe you talk very precisely. There, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because people will sometimes say, um, oh, I know you're a voice actor, but do you do any real acting? And I, it always, it always strikes me a little bit like in my heart when they say that because, because it all is real acting to me, you know, and it all comes from the, you know, the same place and, and takes a lot of the same skills. I have a walk-in closet and I go into my closet with my computer and my little recording thing and I have my script up on my iPad and I just record it, send it. Every once in a while I do have to go into my agent's office or a casting office, but for the most part I do it from home. Voice actors are very philanthropic people. They don't always talk about it a lot publicly because that's not why they do it uh, but there's all kinds of things that they they everybody basically wants to give back because they feel so blessed in, in being in this industry uh, I know myself um, I I'm a part of this program that calls up uh, ill kids in hospitals and uh, in character so I've I've called as spider-man I've called as Green Lantern I've called as Jack from Transformers um, I love doing that. I tend to maybe sometimes be overly thankful of, of my fan base or to my fan base because I don't, you know, I, 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 you know, I'd be working in an office if, if not for them. There are many aspects of voice acting. Documentary work, commercial work, 
what do you want to do? Anything you can do, I think, to, to explore acting, whether it's um, plays at school or local theater or making movies with your friends. I mean, those are all things that I did and I think helped to prepare me for, you know, finding, you know, finding what, what characters I do well with. I'd say the only time I'd really get recognized in person for voiceover would be people that, that know me from a convention or something. I, I, it's, uh, it's one of the little perks of VO that uh, you're pretty anonymous. You know, for the most part, you can just go anywhere and nobody has a clue who you are.